Good day, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's special edition of uh, Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara. Early Sunday morning, 14th of April, Iran launched its widely telegraphed strike on Israel in retaliation for the 1st of April Israeli strike in Damascus, Syria, in which a number of Iranian military officers were killed, senior officers. While the Iranian attack was unprecedented in its scale, uh, and it was the first time Iran had targeted Israel proper from Iran itself, Israel and the U.S.-led allies thwarted almost the entire complement of drones and missiles that were fired. As a result, markets today are, uh, are calm this morning. Um, but here with me today to discuss the attack, what it means, and where we're headed is Dennis Ross, one of America's most experienced diplomats and negotiators in the Middle East, serving in senior positions in the George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama administrations. Today, he is the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and he is a senior advisor at our strategic pa uh, partner firm, West Exec Advisors. So Dennis, thanks for joining me today on, on, on short notice, and, and thank you again for all of your efforts with us over the course of this, uh, over the course of this news breaking weekend. But maybe we can just start here by um, by stepping back for a moment and and getting your assessment of um, you know we, we've all seen the news and have the basic fact pattern of what happened over the course of the weekend but but your take on that and 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 what it means and then we'll unpack that and talk about where we go from here so let, let's sort of frame this in terms of why did it happen what happened uh, and as you said where we go from here why did it happen Iran decided it was going to change the rules of the game with Israel. And what I mean by that is you made a reference in your introduction to the fact that the Israelis on, on April 1st uh, took out in a residential building next to the consulate in Damascus seven senior officers in the Revolutionary Guard Quds Force. Uh, the Hassan Madani, that's what the how the Israelis referred to uh, the general, the most senior general who was taken out is a guy who was fundamentally responsible for not only being the main interface with Hezbollah and Hassan Nasrallah, uh, meaning all the arms and everything that goes there, coordinating what they do in terms of their strikes across the Israeli border, which are geographically contained, but still ongoing, uh, key to organizing and facilitating all the, the weaponry for the proxy militias in Syria and Iraq, and the spearhead behind a massive effort to bring arms into the West Bank. So the Israelis saw this as a target of opportunity. This is a guy who was probably the most important Revolutionary Guards leader, other than uh, Hassan, uh, Hassan Soleimani, who was killed in, in January, 19, uh, January 2020 by the Trump administration. So they took a, they, they said, okay, this is a guy who we're going to affect, who affects their, who take him out of operation. This will disrupt what Iran can do. And then the purpose is we're going to show that they can't be organizing all these attacks against us with a kind of impunity. Their officers who are involved, they'll pay the price. Iran basically said, you do this from now on, uh, you're going to trigger direct attacks from us and not just from our proxies. Uh, and it's clear now, Israel, the next time they, they look at a, a target like this, they're going to think about, are we, is, it, is the payoff from, from killing this guy enough to justify the risk we may be running with the Iranians? So the Iranians are trying to change the rules of the game. In fact, you actually had the head of the Iranian military say that. We're trying, literally, explicitly, we're changing the rules of the game. Uh, what happened? Uh, Basically, you had Iran launch about 350 drones, cruise missiles, uh, and, and ballistic missiles. Every single one of the cruise missiles and the drones was intercepted before it got to Israel. Israel did the vast majority, but I shouldn't say, well, they did two-thirds. We and others, principally us, but others, and it even included the Jordanians, uh, we took out one-third. We intercepted one-third of what was sent of the cruise missiles and the drones. 
Uh, there were between 110 and 120 ballistic missiles that the Iranians fired, primarily but not exclusively at the south. They were going after two air bases that the Israelis have in the Negev. Uh, and as, as if they were trying to say, okay, we're going to affect your ability to launch air attacks against us by going after these two air bases. There was very minimal damage. One C-130 was slightly damaged. A bunch of holes were dug. Uh, the bases never stopped operating throughout this period. Uh, the damage that was that, that was inflicted has already been repaired. Uh, there was one seven-year-old Bedouin little girl who has been seriously injured, is in the hospital, hit by a shrapnel that was not from the uh, Iranian missiles, but was hit by an iron dome, uh, the, the remnants of an iron dome that intercepted it. So from a standpoint of the, it was a complete failure militarily for the Iranians. They are publicly saying it was a great success because they required, they forced Israel to expend a lot of, of missiles in defense. The Iron Dome missiles, Arrow missiles were outside the atmosphere in effect, in interception. David Sling, which was intermediate. The cost of, of all those missiles is high. Uh, and Iran is claiming great success because of that. By the way, what the Iranians did, it wasn't cheap for them either. But they're they're claiming a great success from that standpoint. Uh, the administration is claiming great success, legitimately so, that everything we've done to create an integrated early warning and air and missile defense, the early warning is already completely integrated. Everybody sits with their consoles. We get a launch. Everybody gets that, can see it at the, in real time at the same time. Uh, the ability to organize the defense in light of that was was clearly very well done. And it shows, I would say, something very interesting. Israel has always said it will defend itself by itself. But as it faces by its own admission seven fronts, turns out they need help. Uh, and the fact that a third of these interceptions were done by others is unprecedented. And it also shows the how this regional coalition is functioning. That will create for Israel at least a factor when they consider what they do. Now let's get to what happens now. There is before a we, before we do that, can I just can I just interrupt for one second here? Because you of made course. this point about the uh, about you know Iran championing this as a success. Nonetheless, Israel and the and the United States and others uh, mitigated it overwhelmingly. So, what in the end do you think? Iran actually accomplished in the in the bigger picture beyond crossing that taboo of actually striking Israel from Iran? And does that make it easier to do so going forward? Going back to what you said at the very beginning, they have now changed the rules of the game to make Israel consider how, how high of a price they're willing to endure to take out a target of opportunity as they did on the 1st of April. I think that's the, the one thing that they achieved. They didn't achieve anything else. Uh, by the way, before their own proxies, okay, they they responded and said, "See, we're tough." On the other hand, that the this the gap technologically between Israel, us, and the Iranians is dramatic. That they could have fired three hundred and fifty, and only seven ballistic missiles get through and cause no damage. It's stunning. It was a stunning failure uh, from an operational standpoint. But from the standpoint of saying, OK, Israel, we are free to continue to put our officers all around you to orchestrate all sorts of threats against you. But if you respond against us, then we are going to we will we will attack you directly. That's the new calculus they're trying to create. One of the reasons the Israelis will be driven to try to do something in response is to say, forget it. We can impose a higher price on you than you can impose on us. That's the uncertainty right now. But but at a minimum, what they have forced the Israelis to do is next time they have a target of opportunity, they have to ask themselves the question, is it worth it taking that target of opportunity out? And that clearly was not the case. You know, you could have said, gee, in the midst of the Gaza war, did you really want to go ahead and take out these guys? That clearly wasn't even an issue. And I would even say the the operational intelligence that the Israelis demonstrated, along with us, was again extraordinary. But there was an, another uh, there was another failure in assessment, because clearly, the, when, when the decision was made to do this, the military intelligence and Mossad said, you can do it and there won't be a response. 
And obviously there was. So Israel has to rethink that. And the Iranians want them to rethink that. Uh, but the Israelis also want the Iranians to think about, you don't get to continue to threaten us with impunity. And why do you think that in this particular instance, the Iranians, it seemed to me unusually, you know, um, they basically went public the moment they launched the drones, which we knew were going to then take several hours to reach uh, Israel um, and said, hey, here it comes. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, in a very coordinated fashion, their representative at the United Nations in New York well, went to great pains to say, and that is it. We're done. Um, it's the it's the retaliation for what you did from our uh, from our perspective. The, uh, the book is now closed. Why were they so public uh, about this? This is I mean, it, what we got is a telltale indicator, which in my mind is completely consistent with a longstanding pattern. Iran never wants to fight a direct war with anybody who can hurt it. Look, even when they, you know, they launch missiles uh, into Pakistan and Pakistan immediately responded, they immediately, and then Iran immediately sent, uh, you know, this is a month ago, immediately sent a team to Pakistan. Let, let's, let's calm this down. Uh, they don't want to get into a war with the Israelis. Uh, they certainly don't want to get into a war with us. And everything about this was designed to make a statement, yes, inflict damage. Those who say this was just symbolic, you don't fire 350 projectiles, rockets, missiles, uh, drones, just to make a statement. Yes, you were making a statement, but you wanted to inflict damage and you failed. But you, but basically, you wanted to make a statement without getting into a real war. And so the what you have is Iran, not only in terms of the announcement you described, they were sending messages to the administration a week ago saying we're going to respond. This was their way of saying we're giving you advance notice. It's like it's not quite the equivalent, but after we took out Soleimani and they said they were going to do something, before they hit the al-Assad base, they let the Iraqi prime minister know which base they were going to hit so he would tell us, so we could prepare. The idea was they knew if they killed too many Americans that we would then respond. So they were going to make a statement, but they wanted to they wanted to make a statement in a way that would not lead to an all-out war. And this is consistent with a general risk aversion. Now, having said that, the interesting question is, so why do they now decide to respond to the Israelis? The Israelis have been doing what they call this war between the wars for years. Right. So so why? Why now? And and the only thing I can think of is that three weeks before they had lost another officer. Uh, and I think they decided, OK, it's time for us to send a message to the Israelis. You don't get to go after our officers with impunity. So here we have both sides basically saying you can't act against us with impunity. The problem is I don't see any indication that the Iranians are going to stop doing what they've been doing with all of their proxies. So this is kind of a Gordian knot that's not so easy to undo. So I think for our audience's sake, it's fair to say that you are, are probably the American diplomat who spent more time face-to-face uh, -face with Benjamin Netanyahu than almost anybody else. Um, talk about Bibi's calculus now um, and the imperatives for Israel uh, in terms of how they respond to this now game-changing um, uh, decision by, by Iran. You know, the... Even the way you, you present the question is already begins to highlight the dilemma. Here's a game-changing decision by Iran. Can Israel live with Iran having made a game-changing decision? Uh, that will be one of the one of the most important imperatives that is being discussed. And it's going to be one of the one of the motivators for the Israelis to do something. But look at the pressures that Bibi faces right now. I call them a set of strategic pressures that lead in one direction, a set of political pressures that lead in a different direction. The strategic imperative is you now know you really can't do this by yourself. Israel has Israel has taken great pride, but it's also been part of their persona, their identity. We defend ourselves by ourselves, and suddenly, guess what? No, you don't. Uh, so you actually depend on others, and you can't be dismissive or ignore the concerns and interests of the others. A totally new reality for Israel. So that argues, well, you were part of a regional coalition. That's an advantage. 
don't take the fact that you can't do it all on your own by yourself. Don't take that as a detriment. Look at it as an advantage. You now have partners who are prepared to play this role with you, and that adds to Israel's strength. That's going to be the argument strategically. Listen to your partners. They're asking you not to do something. The political imperative is that Ben Gavir and Smotrich are basically saying, you don't retaliate against the Iranians, we leave the government. And Bibi, as we've seen, seems to put a high premium on preserving this government because he doesn't want to go to elections. October 7th has a legacy politically right now. You look at the polls consistently that show 70 to 75% of the, of the government, 70 to 75% of the public want him to leave. Don't trust the government. Uh, that's hardly a circumstance in which you want to go to an election. So how does he weigh all this? And he's still got the war in Gaza that he has to conclude. And there's this, there's one other element, the psychological element. Israeli deterrence has always been based on two elements. One element is if, if, if we lose a, a, a hangnail, you lose your arm. Always create a disproportionate consequence for the side that did something to you. But the second is Israel can never be pressured by anyone else not to do what it has to do in its own defense. And here there is clearly a pressure from us for Israel not to retaliate. So how do you square that circle? Um, for one thing, you kind of temporize. And we're already seeing that. The best indicator that Israel is not doing anything immediately, the home front has announced uh, the schools can resume. There's no way this goes on that they're planning something to do something imminently if the schools are open. No way. Uh, so they're not planning something imminently. But then again, the Iranians didn't do anything imminently. It was April 1. We were talking two weeks, 13 days before they did anything. You have Benny Gantz saying, Benny Gantz is in the War Cabinet. Uh, Benny Gantz is saying that we will... We will respond, but we will do it at a time, a place, and in a character and way of our own choosing. You know, well, that could be. It may months. not be overt and and direct. And I and I and that's what I would put my finger on. Now, do I know what they're going to do? I do not know what they're going to do. If I were in their shoes, I would be thinking about a major cyber attack. What do they need to be able to do from their own standpoint? They need to show the Iranian leadership. You did something. You tried to change the rules of the game. We can impose on you in a way that you will not like, and that will raise the cost to you. Don't think you can change the rules in a way that, that we will live with or that you will find acceptable even from your own standpoint. So Israel could do a massive cyber attack. It's not, And they can say, okay, the, the Iranians will try to do it in kind. The Iranians are trying on a cyber basis almost every day to do things in Israel. But what Israel can do here, there's a real asymmetry of power as well. They can shut down a lot of Iran. They can shut down most of Tehran. Uh, so maybe they do something along those lines. Maybe they wait a while and then, you know, and then they do something covertly against one of the military bases that was responsible for launching the cruise missiles or the uh, or the drones. So they have options other than an overt military retaliation against the bases. They're not going to respond against urban areas, but they will go after they if they have a military target, the military target is going to be uh, one of the military bases that was somehow responsible uh, for this. I don't see them going after the nuclear program. If they go after the nuclear program, then they know they're triggering a wider war, and then they know they're probably triggering 150,000 rockets from Hezbollah. So I want to pivot to the United States here in a moment, but if I can distill down everything you just said, given the strategic versus political pressures and imperatives that Netanyahu is under, and also given the historic that historic perspective that you just gave of, 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 of Israel, um, you know, always looking out for its own defense, irrespective of, uh, of whether they've got international support or not. Essentially, what you are saying is, is that Netanyahu is the single biggest variable about what's going to ha kind of happen next at this, at this point. I think that's a very good encapsulation. The way I would even encapsulate it further, he has to choose between the strategic benefits and interests for Israel and the political pressures that he's under. Uh, in the past, I would have said without qualification, he would choose the strategic 
reality. Uh, in the current setting, I still think that's probably more likely than not, but the political factors are significant for him. Uh, and it leaves me not certain. I just, and to, to add to one other element, he can also rationalize in his mind strategically that he has to impose a price on Iran, not just for political reasons, but again, for deterrence reasons. Uh, and and he knows that's part of the Israeli ethos. So that's it's, there's something that that connects the strategic and the political. So it makes it, I think it's, it's not at all clear what they're going to do, uh, but I do think he's under very different kinds of pressures uh, within, in both directions. Uh, we'll see what he decides. My instinct tells me it's more of a, a covert response than an overt response. Okay, let me pivot to the United States here, and I have two questions for you on that front. One, what at this point do you think is the U.S. kind of interest in what they are going to be promoting in the um, uh, in the region, given given the changed dynamic here? But secondly, um, obviously, is the aid package um, that involves both Israel and Ukraine that is attempting to be that uh, the Speaker Johnson is trying to get through uh, Congress. It seems to me. On the one hand, you have a moment to shore up the Democratic side here, which has been very focused on the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. All of a sudden now, uh, Israel is defending itself against our sort of sworn enemy in, in, in Iran. But secondly, um, again, Iran is, was flinging the same stuff at Israel that Russia is flinging at Ukraine. And you can see the defensive asymmetry here, right, in the sense that in the it, with with all of that kit, Israel successfully mitigated this attack. Ukraine is in deep need. Does all of this tie together? I do believe it does. Uh, I think it's it's pretty hard for Speaker Johnson not to bring this to the floor, the supplemental to the floor this week. Iran was hitting, trying to hit Israel with the very killer drones that it's giving to the Russians that they're using uh, against the against Ukraine. And if Ukraine had the kind of, of defenses the Israelis had, they too would be able to blunt what the Russians are doing. If the Russians are depending upon Iranian technology, uh, then it's pretty clear our technology trumps that. Uh, and at a minimum, there'll be a strong pressure to basically to provide the supplemental for Israel, just because it probably costs the Israelis close to a billion dollars uh, to expend everything they did to stop this. Uh, so they'll be in need there. And I think it's hard to rationalize doing only Israel at a time when Iran and Russia are clearly in alliance. One of the proofs of the alliance, Russia came out immediately and said what Iran did was in self-defense. So this is no, I mean, there's no escaping that they have a they have an alliance now. Uh, and for Speaker Johnson not to allow this to go through, I mean, it looks like he ends up supporting the Iranians, the Russians. I mean, this is, I think it's... Uh, I would hope it's untenable. I don't know with you know with MAGA and with people like Marjorie Green whether it's untenable, but I suspect with with Speaker Johnson himself, who has, has shown sympathy towards the Ukrainians, that this really sharpens the need to to get this done, and it becomes a statement. So that's kind of one broad point. I do agree with you on that. Uh, in addition, I would say, uh, in terms of where we are, you know, on the one hand, this is a a remarkable demonstration of the effectiveness of our technology. Uh, and it sends a message to everybody in the region, you know, you're probably, probably a good idea to be aligned with the Americans. And the U.S., you know, for all the questions about uh, reliability of the United States, the U.S. was there. You know, we helped. We didn't shy away. Now, it's true, we don't want the Israelis to strike back. Uh, and, and I think the truth is nobody in the region wants the Israelis to strike back, not because they wouldn't like to see Iran hurt, but because nobody in the region wants a wider war. So we are going to push for that. We'll see how the Israelis respond. Uh, I do think it also raises the question of, is there a greater chance to see a hostage deal right now than before? And the reason I raise that is the, the, the key variable in Hamas is one guy. It's not... Khalid Mashal, it's not Israel Khani, it's none of the political leadership uh, of Hamas. It's Shaisha Sinwar, uh, who's somewhere in, in deep underground in a tunnel in Gaza. He had expected on October 7th he was going to set the Middle East on fire. 
the West Bank would explode, Hezbollah would launch all of its rockets against Israel, Israeli Arabs would rise up, and none of that happened. Okay, then the next time for that, he thought Ramadan. Ramadan, you know, Jerusalem will explode, that will set the whole Middle East on fire, and I'll be vindicated that way. That didn't happen. Then I think he looked at, okay, now Iran is going to do this. Let's see what whether that sets off a regional conflict. So far, that hasn't happened. Now, does that mean that he will change his calculus? Hard to say, but I think it it may increase the possibilities of a hostage deal. The administration wants this above all else right now. It sees a 45-day pause as being able to solve the humanitarian issues, not only in terms of material going in, but to create a structure to receive it and to create a secure mechanism to distribute it. And it sees the Saudis will not negotiate and finalize a possible normalization deal if, as long as the war is going on. So if they have a 45-day pause, they want to go in there, try to nail us down, then take to Netanyahu. Here's You can have a deal now with the Saudis. Here's what's required on the Palestinians. Anything that's required on the Palestinians will break his government. But then the administration banking on, okay, your legacy is October 7th, or your legacy is you have a transforming deal with the Saudis, which changes the Middle East, uh, changes the character of the conflict forever. Which which legacy do you want? And notable, you mentioned Saudi Arabia there, um, that you know much has been made of, uh, of Jordanian participation in the defense of Israel over the course of the weekend. Uh, but Saudi airspace was also um, uh, opened for, uh, for, for the U.S. and others, yeah? Yep. No, look, this was, a, this was a regional coalition. And you can see that regional coalition becoming very valuable in terms of counting, counting not just Iran, but all of, its, all of its proxies. And we have a demonstration of the gap in means between the proxies and this regional coalition. So, you know, this was, it's an interesting question. Did, did Iran make a smart move by doing what it did? Um, you know, it kind of has exposed itself on the one hand. Uh, it has shifted the focus away from, from Gaza on the other. Uh, again, one of the reasons that Israel might not want to, although I'm not sure this is going to be a definitive, it might not want to respond is because the attention right now is on Iran and Iran being the source of all the conflicts in the region, or at least exploiting all the conflicts in the region. Do you really want to take the focus off of that? So given that regional coalition that you just talked about, and you mentioned a few minutes ago that Russia is sort of the one country that kind of threw its weight all in uh, with, with Iran on this, talk about China's interest here. It seems more um, co complex. China clearly and, and are they and can they be co-opted in any way? I, I have the view that it's worth trying. Whether they can be or not is not clear, but I would say the following. China gets 47%, 47% of China's oil passes through the Strait of Hormuz. You want a region-wide war that threatens that? You want a region-wide war that is going to bump the price of oil up dramatically? You know, right now. It's funny how maybe not so funny, but it's it's not it's it's noteworthy. The Gaza war has had a marginal effect on the price of oil. If there is a, a war between Israel and, and, and Iran, the price of oil goes up dramatically. China has no interest in that, especially at a time when it's facing real economic difficulties. Economic growth is the core of the social contract the Communist Party in China has with its public. You give us complete carte blanche to run everything, we improve your life. And guess what? Uh, given the collapse of the real estate market, uh, given the demographic problems that they have, uh, given the fact they're still shackling the private sector, which has been the engine of growth there, uh, the Xi's need for political control is costing them in a big way economically. They have no easy way out of the current economic process and the last of the current economic problems. The last thing they need is the price of oil to go up dramatically uh, at a time when they're the world's biggest importer of oil. So they have an interest in preventing this from expanding in a way that the Russians have exactly the opposite interest. It's totally in their interest to have the price of oil go up dramatically. 
totally in their interest to have the world's attention focused on anything but Ukraine. Uh, so uh, at this point, I would say, you know, the Russians have one interest, the Chinese have a different interest. It's Chinese interest in supporting Russia against an American dominated international rules is one thing, but that's almost an abstraction. What we're describing right now, that's not an abstraction. That's very tangible. So I do think that the Chinese could be a partner because they have some leverage on Iran. And worth noting that this morning, um, the muted response in global oil markets is being read by some as reflective of the, you know, that the situation over the weekend wasn't wasn't a success on Iran's part. But I would note that there's already a, a risk premium built into the price of oil because the current prices don't really reflect the actual supply demand uh, supply demand balance. But along those lines, I, I did want to hit hit you up with one other question before we wrap up here. Um, because before this unfolded over the course of the weekend, the other dramatic event occurred uh, at the end of last week with regards to the commandeering of a, um, uh, of a ship coming out of the UAE, uh, owned by, um, beneficially owned by an Israeli uh, billionaire um, that was about to or was, was, had just traversed the, uh, the Strait of Hormuz, coming out of the Persian Gulf and heading toward the, the, the Sea of Oman. This is an this is another tool that Iran's gotten its toolkit, obviously. But the Strait of Hormuz has been sort of not not really compromised thus far in the post uh, October seventh conflict. Um, thoughts on this on, and what this means? We've already seen with what the Houthis do that international waterways are not immune on the Red uh, Sea something- side. Yeah. Yes, uh, something. 12% of the world's oil passes through that, and 30% of the container traffic worldwide passes through the Red Sea. So, you know, something I think still needs to be done when it comes to the security and sanctity of these international waterways. Strait of Hormuz is obviously something the Iranians always want to be able to implicitly threaten, but they also have their own reasons as to be careful about doing it. This is one of those things they kind of hold in reserve. If you threaten us and there's a war against us, if you think anybody, everybody else is going to be able to export their oil and we can't, think again. The seizure of this was part of their response to April 1. I don't believe you'll see them release this ship anytime soon because they're kind of holding it to see what happens. Uh, if, if it becomes clear that nothing's going to happen over time, then maybe they release it. But right now, I think they will continue to hold it. And it's a reminder to everybody we have the capacity to disrupt the traffic if we see fit to do so. I want to ask one last one last question. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of get the sense a lot of corporate America and many market participants obviously have got a lot of concerns, a lot going on um, in, in the world, a lot going on in the domestic U.S. political scene, U.S. economic scene. Et cetera. They got a lot of um, a, a lot of things to consider, um, and to a certain degree, since you know October seventh, uh, there's been a an ability to kind of compartmentalize uh, the conflict in the in the region. Most company or a lot of companies that don't have direct exposure, for instance, um, you know, and even those with employees in say the UAE and and and, and other Gulf states, were able to kind of compartmentalize this, and then all of a sudden it came rushing back over the course of this uh, this weekend. In your in your view, is corporate America being a little bit complacent here, or I guess to put it another way, with you when you think about all of the variables that are out there going forward that you've been talking about and some that we haven't even covered in today's conversation, um, are you, as a longtime experienced diplomat in the region, concerned that some of these things can still very much blow up in a in a uh, in a significant manner uh, that that even those not directly exposed would have to consider. Well, we know how interconnected the world is. Uh, we see it when you disrupt supply lines. It affects everyone. So yes, I am uneasy about quite a few things. It isn't to say I could easily see this current imbroglio. I could easily see it being contained, that Israel chooses not to respond immediately, and when it chooses to respond, it does so in the shadows. We've seen what was a shadow war between Israel and Iran taken out of the shadows. The Israelis could put it back into the shadows by the way they respond, and this could be contained for now. The problem is the Iranian nuclear program is going ahead. Uh, nothing will be done this year because we're in an election year. 
next year, whomever is president is going to have to deal with it. Uh, and that has all sorts of implications about what could happen, number one. Number two, uh, you know, let's assume the supplemental does pass this week. That will put Ukraine in a different position, enable far more capable to defend itself, raise the cost to the Russians. Uh, if you're the Russians, are there is there a lot more that Putin can do? Maybe there's not much more he can do. They're not exactly they haven't exactly shown the strength of their military. But if there's more he could do before this begins to reflect itself on the battlefield, he has an incentive to do a lot more a lot sooner. Uh, what are the implications of that? Does he decide to try to disrupt for the first time supply lines into Ukraine? He's never done that. One of the striking things is no Russian attacks against any NATO member that is facilitating the movement of equipment into, into Ukraine. Does he try to do that? Um, these, are, these are questions. Maybe the answers will, will tend in the right direction, meaning they'll tend towards greater calm than not. But, you know, when you do contingency planning, you do it not on the basis of likelihood, you'll do it on the basis of severity of consequence. So I look at those two things. What about China? Does China decide to do something more on Taiwan? Right now, my guess is probably not. There are those who say the more the economic difficulties, the greater the incentive to do something against Taiwan, to you know, decide, okay, we're going to resolve the issue of unification once and for all. Here again, I think probably not. But, you know, you... It depends on the pressures that each of these leaders are under. And when leaders are under pressures, you can't always count on them making the most rational decision, or at least the decision that we would think would be the most rational. From their standpoint, they can define it as being, yeah, this is what my needs require. So yeah, these are just a small sample of the th that obviously concern me, not to mention our election. There are implications. Implications for the whole American alliance system if Donald Trump is elected. Forget the implications here, there are implications internationally. Uh, now, they can, I can also see someone like Trump going to, to Putin and sacrificing Ukraine. I can see that. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of, these are a lot of unknowns right now. For me, they raise the, the, the sense of risk and uncertainty. Uh, they can all turn out okay, but they they can all take on a life of their own as well. So given that, let me just land the plane with this. I mean, given everything that you just talked about in terms of U.S. interests, U.S. what is what is uh, what is com commanding the time of both the current uh, uh, occupant of the White House and potentially the the next uh, globally and with uh, and with uh, regards to domestic U.S. politics as well, but. To just focus back in uh, for one last moment on on the Middle Eastern region, how does the current situation sort of stand? You're you know you've been active in the region for forty plus years, and anybody who watches any documentaries on the region will see you <laughs> sitting there with everybody from Netanyahu to Arafat and everybody else. Um, how complicated, how uncertain is the situation in the region today in the historic context of your career? It is more complicated at, at, than at any time that I've worked on the issue because you have multiple threats coming from multiple sites. Even if Iran is, is kind of the linchpin of this, Iran has developed all these different proxies. One of whom, the Houthis, they probably don't, they have influence on, but they don't control. Every other, all the other proxies they have, they have a lot of control. All We saw it in the you know, after we struck back after Tower 22 was hit and we lost three soldiers, there were 166 attacks from October, you know, right after the uh, Hamas act on October 7th until February 2nd. We retaliated uh, by hitting 85 sorts after 85 sites after waiting three days and then a couple of days later taking out the deputy commander of Hezbollah. There hasn't been one attack against American bases or presence That's, since that time. Yeah which tells you they completely control the the militias in Iraq and Syria. They don't completely control the Houthis. They have enormous influence over Hezbollah. The only reason I say it slightly differently, Hezbollah has its own interest in Lebanon. And there are times when those interests in Lebanon can conflict with what the Iranians want. But I have to be honest, 
I've never seen a single instance where Hezbollah hasn't done what Iran wanted, including going into Syria, which was highly costly to Hezbollah. And for a while, they tried to hide the fact they were doing it. So, yeah, you know, I'm saying there may be some distinction there, but I haven't seen any evidence that Hezbollah ever does something that Iran doesn't want. Well, Dennis Ross, thank you very much for your time today and for your uh, and for your insights. I think the net net of everything you just said is that we will be back uh, uh, having these conversations um, going forward. But until then, um, uh, you should know that Taneo and its partners at West Exec Advisors will continue to be following developments and um, and offering our thoughts and analysis. However, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to us either to your uh, Taneo contact, or you can always reach us at TaneoInsights at Taneo.com. Until next time, I'm Kevin Kajiwara, Dennis Ross. Thank you for your time today. And thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm.